Welcome back to the Beaver Banter Podcast. I'm Nick Daniel, and I cover Oregon State football and basketball for the Oregonian and Oregon Live. The Beavers suffered their first setback of the football season for 2022, losing to USC 17 to 14 at Research Stadium last Saturday night. Joining me on the on the podcast as usual each week is former Oregon State cornerback Kyle White. Welcome back, Kyle. Thank you, thank you. So um, obviously, I was at the stadium um, with. 28,000 plus people that were kind of on the edge of their seats all night. And where did, where did you see the game? I was again, standing up um, at my family law's house on the coast. So we were in Walport. Did you guys have a text chain going with, with players on Saturday? Yeah, we, I mean, it was really quiet up until right at the end of the game when it was that controversial who messed up, what happened at the end of the game, like who was scored on, what coverage was it, and we were going back and forth, back and forth. It was it was just a lot of sadness and stress and anxiety up. And, you know, I I think the Beavers love doing it to the fans because, I mean, there's been some great games from the Beavers lately. (laughs) Well, I mean, they they are three and one, so they've they've been on the plus side more than the minus side. But... (laughs) But yeah, I mean that was that was certainly a game where I mean I thought I thought coming away from it you could say, man, Oregon State should have won that game. But I also thought USC could have said the same thing. It wasn't like you know one side dominated and lost or got lucky and won. It you know both sides had their moments and it just came down to you know a play here or there. It really was it came down to. I mean, you can probably pick four or five plays. Any one of those goes in Oregon State's favor, and it's probably a W uh, last Saturday. Um, what uh, What were your initial thoughts on the game and, and the outcome? Truthfully, um, my favorite part of the Beavers' offense now is Griffin. I love him as a running back. I think he was a heavy spark to the offense. Uh, defensively, we played really well, kept them at low points. That was awesome. Uh, Again, you know, there's always some flags here and there, penalties. You know, we can definitely work on. I was frustrated with all the interceptions. That was the one negative that you can really, really pinpoint out of the whole game. But, you know, that's that's something that you can easily go over and something that can be easily fixed in the weight room. And I think that has to go to not forcing a ball on top of pass protection. And I mean, if we can, you know, work on those two things. And again, just like we said last week, that might be one of the two hardest games we'll have to play all season. I'm okay with how we looked. I think we played well and held our own up until the end. Yeah. You, it, the, the thing with Saturday night is you, you can't, you can't make it be two losses or three losses. You gotta, you gotta, you know, it was a game you could have won and maybe down the road you'll win one like that. But you can't let that one linger and and go to Utah and get run out because they'll do it and then and then suddenly lose all your momentum going you know in the weeks to come. So, um, so there were several pivotal plays in the game. I I thought um, and I'm sure I'm going to forget some of them, but you know the fumble at the one yard line, boy, that was if you know that when the balls the ball I, I saw a video of the ball. F- popped up in the air. It was probably four or five feet up in the air. Um, shoot, that's a 50-50 ball at that point. You just, if Oregon State gets that, it's, I mean, it's a Jack Coletto touchdown more than likely if, if, if they don't recover in the end zone even. So um, I don't know what you remember about that play. but Oh, yeah. When you see, I think Oregon State had a great defensive stop. I was like, oh, we're about to score off just the fumble, and it was on the one-yard line. I was – crazy like energize all electricity in my household and we're just up and ready to scream a touchdown all of a sudden it's on the one uh they get out and that was just a very pivotal point play that could have just changed the whole momentum of the game and then we would have been playing on the attack instead of you know just sitting there 50 50 between usc and oregon state and i mean there again just like you're saying there's multiple multiple i mean with Oregon State having the ball, they had a chance to go down and score. I think that they were moving the ball down pretty well, and you force a throw into triple coverage. I don't know. But, you know, I can see that he had pressure. Uh, again, it happened again where it's like we're going down the field again. 
force another one. Again, there's pressure, and you just have a six six. I think he was six six middle linebacker that happens to be actually yeah, good with yeah. hands. So you know, there's multiple different plays that you can just sit there and what if or what if this one. It's I, I think when you lose the turnover battle, you potentially have lost the game. And so I think that's one thing that Oregon State. Uh, First game or second game out of the four so far that hadn't came up with multiple turnovers, multiple times that we could have. But, you know, like uh, USC came up with theirs and they came out with the win. Yeah, no, st- statistically, it, it's it's proven that turnovers are probably the number one deciding factor in a football game. But on that fumble, um, you know, when you're in the middle of a scrum like that, I don't know how you know how often you've been in one of those, but what what are they like? Oh, they're the worst. But the thing is, is if you're down at the bottom and you have a chance to get it, but you don't have it, you go for it because nobody can see the bottom of the pile until everybody's moved. So, like you know, I think in that instance, Oregon State should have just kept fighting for it until the ref had moved them. I mean, it's hard that it's hard to get your hands on it when somebody else is like it's in dire need, and you're gonna get poked, you're gonna get prodded you're gonna get, everybody's just gonna do whatever they can to make you feel the most uncomfortable to see if you slip up with the ball because in that instance that's when the ball's taken from you so and then the ref never saw it so that's why normally the opposing team on in that instance or the other team or you come up with the ball again in in college or high school or in the cfl did you ever uh i mean would you ever have the ball at the bottom of a pile and then have to hold on to it or I won't lie. When I was in junior college, right before I came to Oregon State, uh, one of my teammates had fumbled. I dove down on it, and I was in the bottom of it. And you feel all this pressure, just everybody on top of you. And all of a sudden, you just start getting all these fingers to the neck, to the <laughs> to the ribs, to the stomach, like somebody's pinching you. Somebody tried to take off my shoe one time. I mean, it, you I'm- never know what happens in them, and you never will know because you can't see on the inside of that pile. But it's not a fun place yeah. to be, but you also are the hero at that moment. Yeah, the uh, the the holding. Uh, you know, another play was the holding penalty on Treshawn Harrison on Martinez's run to the six. Um, you know, he he gets to the eleven, and that's where the hold takes place. I mean, if if, if Treshawn just lets go of him, it just it, the ball's at the eight. I mean, I'm I'm thinking it's probably maybe he doesn't get to the six, but it's first and goal inside the ten. Instead, it goes back to the. Shoot, I think it went back to the 21, then it was delay a game, and then I think there was more lost yards, and they missed a field goal. I mean, it was – it was. I don't know. I I don't know if you remember that play. Pro- I probably do. Yeah. I mean what, – what, what did you see? The way Griffin was running the ball, you don't need to hold. You know, he was already two, three yards outside of him. You know, you could just let him go, and if he's a great running back, which I think that Griffin is a great running back, he'll make a miss if needed. Or I think he had the momentum to just skate past him regardless. Uh, there was no need for a hold. There was no need for you to overly, you know, block. I think it was a great block up until the moment that Griffin got to the outside of him. At that time, you have to let go. I know it gets hard when you don't know where the ball is at between your right and your left because he's running behind you. But if you're, if the corner decides to take a direction – you got to either push him that way even more to bounce the running back back in, which he'll understand, or just let him go and, hey, you want a battle because we got a first down. So, you know, like when it came to that play, yeah, it, it was very rough to see because it was such a great, explosive, much-needed play that had all the momentum going our way and get called back and then another penalty. And it was just like we can't, we can't just keep letting these happen, you know, like – we need right. to change momentum. Then there's the play that obviously, if Oregon State stops it, the game's over. I, I don't see any way in the world USC wins if they stop the fourth and six at midfield where Caleb Williams runs for the first down. Um, I've probably watched that 50 times just to see you know, was there forward progress stopped? You know, who had a chance to get him? You know, how did the play set up? I asked Jonathan whether he thought forward progress had been stopped. He didn't. He didn't think so. He thought it was a bang bang type play, but. I mean, you know, Caleb Williams is, is kind of caught back there, and he, he, he starts taking off. Andrew Chatfield's got a hand on – sort of a hand on his shoulder pad, but he doesn't get enough of it to really slow him down. Then Jaden Grant's got him by the, by the you know, lower legs, and, 
and he's trying to get him down. And then Omar Spates has got him teed up and he just can't quite get, just can't quite get him down. And then the, and then the offensive line just comes and runs over everybody and pushes him past. But what, what, what did you see on that play? Literally exactly how you described it. I, I saw a great defensive stop potentially. Uh, when you got one guy that hits the quarterback and you're like, okay, is this it? And then he just starts going and you see Jaden Grant and he just stops him. Like all momentum was stopped. And then we have like two, three other beavers. And I'm like, come on, let's go. Like all you got to do is just keep them there. And I mean, just like coach Smith said, I think that forward momentum wasn't stopped like because it's such a bang, bang moment. And you don't know, you have to give it at least three seconds or so where it's just like, okay, like, I don't want him just getting hit, hit, hit. But it was a yeah. moment where, like, I think Oregon State's defense, you have to – and I can't – I'm not going to – I can't say it was them because they played so hard at that moment and, like, down – repetitive after time after time after time again. They were there, and that moment is more of like a – if I wanted to nitpick at it, you just have to have all the guys, like, come on, we got to push this. And so, you know, with one person on the wrong side of them, you're either pushing him forward or backward. In that moment, he got pushed forward to the first. And so it's just yeah, good play by Caleb, but uh, it, it was a rough one because that, that could have been it. How deflating is that for a defense to, to come up short on a play like that? Because, you know, you've got to get right back into it and try to stop him again. But, you know, you know that's the game if you'd stopped him there. It hurts. It stings because you did so well. And you're like, all right, like I did my job. Normally when it comes to fourth down, they're punting. But because it's the end of the game, like you got to sit there and go, it's not over yet. And you have to retrain your mind. We're starting back at one, even though it's fourth down, because you never know yeah. what's going to happen after that. And so, you know, like I know it hurt them. I know it sucks. And I know that they were on the field and they were fighting all game long. But you just got to buy in on one more play. That's all you got to do. Then I guess the last play that, you know, is – this side of the game, obviously, it was a touchdown to Jordan Addison. It, uh, Jonathan s- described the, you know, he said the coverage was cloud coverage. You know, Rajon Wright was initially on Addison, and he went over to take the take the back out of the backfield in the corner, and the safety was supposed to come over and 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 get Addison, you know, where he, where he caught the ball, but he got there look looked like about a beat too late, and that's all it took. And I, what did you see on that play? So it was so funny because I called cover two as soon as I saw a ball snapped. You can sit there and see it. I mean, if you if you analyze football enough, you can sit there and read that's cover two. And Rajon Wright did everything he was supposed to besides potentially one thing, like if you want to be nitpicky, you want to force him inside of you. So you're reading one to two inside, whereas he pushed him and leveraged him far out, which was perfect either way. And the problem was that the safety never got over top between one and two. So he, I mean, you can call it a push step. You can call it, um, there's different weave steps a safety has to take. But when you see two running out, Rajon Wright did the right thing and he stopped at the two. Could he have like pushed back a little bit more just to bait the, the shorter throw? Yeah. But his uh, job is to take two when he runs out, when he goes out. Yeah. One with a fade. That is all the safety's job. There is nobody else on a two by two. You take that. Why is the safety late on that one? What what would have caused him to be late on that? In my opinion, and this is what Coach Hall always told us, is eyes. I think he got lazy, lackadaisical with his eyes. He was just watching the quarterback, reading the quarterback for way too long. Uh, you read you yeah. read your keys first. That's number one. I mean, a ball is gonna always beat you to a spot unless you're going to the spot because you're reading the actual coverage you're supposed to instead of the quarterback's eyes. I mean, yeah, he should have easily been there. It was a well-thrown ball, but it would have been a great interception if he would have just done his job. I think the coordinators put the perfect play in the right situation at that time, and it just was not fully executed the way it could have been. I, when you're so hurt, just watching that play on repeat, on repeat. And we're just sitting there going through it in the group chat. Like, that was cover three. And I'm like, no, that's cover two. And, it, you know, it's just like, oh, there's a cloud. It's like, yeah, Rajon Wright was in cloud coverage. That means that was safety. There's only two high safeties. 
you should have been there. And so just time after time, just watching that play, it's just so hurtful because that was a moment that could have finished the whole game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, USC still would have had the ball, but I mean, you know, I think at that point it would have been third and 10. And so, I don't know. Obviously, that was a big play. But, um, you know, you got to come away from the game, even though Oregon State lost. I mean, that was that was, that was was as good a defensive effort as you could have expected to see from, from this team. I mean, it's, that's as good as we've seen since probably 2012 season with, with, with what they did against an offense that had been so explosive for three games. Um, what did you think of the game plan? Um, what was, was there one or two things you thought about the game plan was really effective? Yeah. I mean, so when you're looking at, uh, you have Fenwick, you have Martinez and you have Griffin. I think the rotation was really nice. And when they started figuring out who were hot, who's hottest, I like that they started feeding Griffin. I think that our pass. Oh, no, no. I mean, I, I, I was first, I was talking about the defense first, about, what did you think about the defensive game plan? Um, oh, defense was spot Brady. on. I mean, truly, yeah. it's what, what, was there one or two things you really thought really made that defense on 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 Saturday night? Um, not as much. I think they were key and honed in on every area to a point where, like, it was just great play overall. I think the blitzes were time, timed very well throughout the game. Uh, I think that their coverage was well downfield. They were going against some of the best receivers that play in the Pac-12. Some of them were transfers from other conferences, and they played them amazingly. They had the transfer from Oregon that is the running back now at uh, USC. They stopped the run. And, I mean, I saw a stat during the game. They said they had like 300-something yards, uh, four or 500 yards the first three games in. And then come to this game, they had 50 yards like by halftime, something like that. And yeah. I, I was I was in shock because that's how well they were playing overall on defense. And I mean, you can't play better than that. I'm just curious how much, you know, leading into a game, how much do you guys study film in terms of trying to find tells? You know, because it seemed like there had to be a couple of things that maybe USC was doing that they found on film that they could they could tell what was going what, what was what might be coming and how much time do you spend looking for a, you know, signs of, you know, quarterback tipping off a play or, or a receiver tipping off a play. That was one of my favorite things to do. And so some of that also goes into, if you want to keep yourself accountable and hold yourself accountable, play, like watching film outside of the film room with the team. So, you know, like we watch film during, you know, like our film studies. So we probably twice a day, um, not even probably more than that because you have to go through each like special teams, defense, offense, full team, so forth. Um, but you read the keys and you're watching hand signals by the quarterback. You're watching hand signals by the running backs uh, You or how deep is the running back playing? Where's the tight tight end located? Uh, the slot, how tight is he to the line? Is he on the ball, off the ball? Um, if you see a quarterback cue to a receiver or a specific receiver, if you see one receiver in a specific spot more times than not, and he, he runs the same play over and over and over again. So like, those are all things that we sit there and you go over film and you start to memorize. And it, it's literally like studying for a test, but your test is physical and it's actually active. Whereas you're not writing a pencil and paper. So, I mean, day in and day out. Was there was there a game you remember um, where you know you found something and it actually played out to where you could kind of tell they were going to pass, they were going to run, they were going to do something, and and it showed up when you were playing. Yeah, it was actually one of my favorites, and I it wasn't even me, uh, but I remember from the sideline watching it. So uh, I don't know if you remember Tristan Decoud. Uh Yeah, he was a corner for us for Oregon State, and it was we were playing Cal at home. We watched on film more times than not. We talked about it all the time. We're like, yo, if you see the quarterback throw up a five signal like twice to like the outside receiver, it's a hitch regardless. And he's going there. And I remember watching the game and we were, I was staring at the quarterback. I'm looking at the coverage and I'm looking at the field and the personnel. And I look at the quarterback again and he throws this five signal just twice. And I was like, oh my gosh, my eyes lit up. And I looked at Tristan and Tristan's eyes were already lit. Like he didn't even move. By the t- as soon as the ball was snapped, he forgot the whole coverage, sprinted straight to the receiver, and got a pick. And I was like, 
Oh, really? I'm so happy that he, yeah, I was like, if he was not bright enough to read that. But, I mean, trust and watch film as much as anybody, probably more often than a lot of people. So, you know, like, those yeah. are moments that you make your plays. Yeah. So, uh, about the running game, um, you know, it's obviously okay. I mean, they're getting good yard, they're getting decent yardage, but it just, just it seems like there's something missing. And I don't, they're not, they're not, it's not last year's running game. Maybe it's, and I don't know if they're rotating too many guys in and they're not going to one guy in particular. I, I know I talked to Jonathan about that today. You know, he said early in the season, they want to, you know, get <clears throat> all three of them going and, and eventually maybe they will go with one guy, but do you, do you, do you think it's, is there something to, you know, getting a guy on the field and getting him trying to see if you can get him hot? You have get to him get him in a rhythm. Hot. Yeah, you, there has you have to have a main guy and you have to get him hot. So I think that's the uh, discomfort in Oregon State's run game right now is they don't know who the guy is. So he's still trying to figure out who can be that leader in the backfield. Whereas now he's giving low carries, he's giving Griffin carries, he's giving Martinez carries, he's giving fin, Fenwick carries. And it's like you want Fenwick and Martinez to be the guy. Like It's very noticeable. But – in my opinion, Martinez is still young. He has so much time ahead of him. Fenwick is in ways like a bigger back to me where I think he's going to get you short yardage. I think he has explosive plays. I think he's a great running back. But in my opinion, from what I just saw from the USC game is I'm giving Griffin carries more because not only is he getting yak yards, which is yards after uh, like contact, he's – a hype man like he ha he brings the energy he's out there and he makes a play he's screaming he's showing everybody let's go and i think yeah. that was such a momentum thing that helped keep the offense in a positive mood like you know like getting them going more and more often because he just kept like he's like feed me give me the ball i will carry us if i if like i'm given the opportunity and like he made every play even when he got a negative like three yards he come back with the next one, like 10, seven yards. And it's like, okay. Whereas like, I think like right now, Fenwick still needs to find his like groove where it's, when he gets tackled low or on the ankles, he falls, he's done. But he's also six two, six three, six foot, six one. But like, because he's so tall, one hit could be the downfall and he could just fall. Whereas Griffin yeah. is so low, when he takes a hit, he still has all balance. And he's such a hype man. And then Martinez, I think that one, he, he has so much time and he has so much natural athleticism and he's so gifted that one day soon, whether it be this year, halfway through the season or next season beginning, he's going to explode soon. And I've said that since watching his film from when he was a senior till now, I think he's going to explode here pretty soon. Yeah. I mean, you could see little flashes of him. Um, we touched on this earlier about Chance Nolan and the interceptions. Um, some of them were good plays. There was some pressure on Chance. But, I mean, there was two of them where you just you could see it before he even threw the ball. It was going to be a pick because he just I, – I mean, he didn't – I didn't think he had as much pressure. on. He had some pressure, but he th threw both of them off his back foot, and you could just tell they were, they were not going to be good throws, and sure enough, they weren't. The, the deep throw in the third quarter, I mean, they were taking a chance there. I don't know why they were so desperate at the time because it seemed like they had kind of control of the game and they were at midfield. But, you know, you take a shot. That's not – I don't have a problem with that one. And then the last one was, you know, he threw in the triple coverage. And, again, I didn't know they needed to be that desperate. It was third and ten, so maybe. I mean, it seems like you want to – the safe one would have been going for a six to eight yard play and then bringing in Jack Coletto and see what he could do on fourth down. But, you know, it's easy to say from on Monday, Monday night, as opposed to Sunday, Saturday, when you're calling plays, but what did you, I mean, what did you think of, of the interceptions that chance threw? I mean, I think chance Nolan threw some, not even 50, 50, he gave his receivers 25% of a chance. I mean, when you're sitting there throwing into double triple coverage, you're making it hard on yourself, the team, your offense. And I maybe there was something that he saw out there that I couldn't see from, you know, as a fan watching the game. But, I mean, when I'm just watching, and yes, he had pressure on some. But 
just throw it away. Live to play another down. I mean, that's just what I would have done. I mean, not would have done, but I'm not a quarterback. But like, if I were to be in that circumstance, I'm just throwing it away. It's half of them weren't on third down. Just throw it away. You know, yeah. live to play another down. You have shorter routes. You know, if if it's third and ten, throw it to a, you know a six yards out or something, and let your athletes make plays. And that's why. Jonathan Smith is so good at fourth down. You know, you have Coletto. That's a, that's an, a, a privilege. You know, it's a blessing that Oregon State has somebody so big and that knows how to have that fight and that dog in them to go for that fourth and two, fourth and one, fourth and four. Right. So it's like, just give your team a chance instead of trying to go for it all. And I think he's never been hit with that stage yet where it's like, I don't think I've seen Oregon State that packed in that small of a stadium in a long time for the whole game. Yeah. And it could have been stage fright. Yeah. But at the same time, like, you know, you were put on the team and the starting quarterback as a leader, they believe that you would not take that pressure. Like, just play the short routes. Now, if it's Coach Smith that wanted the long route, yeah, I wouldn't force it. I don't know. It, it's rough. And I get you're the quarterback, so all eyes are on you at all times of the day. But, I mean, just throw it away and play for another down. Yeah, I don't mean to be, you know, harsh with, you know, Chance Nolan, but that's the position you, you sign up for when you play quarterback. You're going to get scrutinized, and, and, you know, when you make plays like that, I mean, that's why they pay quarterbacks the most money in the NFL. And so <laughs> it, I guess it just comes with the territory. But, I mean, on the other hand, I mean, he he is – he is Oregon State's best option at this point. I, I don't see any reason why anybody would even think of wanting to make a change at quarterback right now. So he's, I mean, he's he's been solid for the most part. He just got to clean up those four or five throws he has every game that you just you just wonder, oh my, oh where's this go? Where's this going? But I think he'll come back next week, and I think he, you know, he learned his lesson. Like, hey, all right, yeah. I can't do that. He probably talked with the team and said, hey, that's on me. This game's right. on me. I got y'all from here. Like, you know, like don't keep all trust and faith in me. I got you guys. And, you know, I'll pull this one out next time if it comes down to the wire. So. Right. I've seen a lot of great things. He's consistent. You know, this was just a bad moment for him and everybody has him. It just happened at the biggest time where we were going to go four and out. So we, we touched on Reeser on Saturday night. Uh, how did, I mean, I was at the stadium, but how did, how did it come across on TV? I like they didn't show the other side as much, so it made it look very packed all the time. But, you know, like it it looks good. It looks good. Now, you can see that there at times they would show that side and it just be empty. But the sides that were. Well, that side, that side's empty because it's, it's under construction. <laughs> exactly. But everything from all the fans and seeing that they stayed a full game, four quarters, that shows Beaver Nation believes in this team. And Oregon State is – this year's Oregon State team is a team that's going to – I mean, we're, we're, we can do great things. And I believe yeah. – and I think it's going to be amazing to watch Oregon State this year the whole way through. Yeah, I did. I mean, it, it was as it was as electric as I've seen Reese in a long time. And I've, I mean, I've been going games there for decades. And so I've seen a lot of bad football out there and seen some good football. And, I mean, that was, that was something else the other night. I did love that they – that they put USC's band clear up in the Valley View seats way up in the top, top corner of the stadium. And that had to be so hot up there before the game. Cause it was hot on the field and they were up in the top. I mean, it was like 85 you know, before the game and they're in their band uniforms and they're sitting up in this, you know, way at the top of the stadium. And it's kind of funny, but you know, it's USC. I did love so. that. Yeah. Um, so up next for Oregon state is, is Utah. Um, the, the last year, the Beavers won 42-34 in Reister. They were the only team to beat the Utes uh, during uh, in, during the Pac-12 season. They uh, Oregon State trailed 24-14 at halftime, and they out, then they went on a run where they outscored Utah 28-7 to to take a 11-point lead, and they held on in the end. Um, so this is a team, that, they're the last team to beat Utah from the Pac-12. So, you know, they, they've got that feeling, that part feeling good about it. They Two years ago, they went down to Utah and you know, barely lost. They lost thirty to twenty-four. I think Chance Nolan um, had Oregon State on a on a drive that you know could have won the game. They came up short on it, but so they you know they they played well in that stadium. But 
that year that stadium was empty. This is going to be a different situation. I, I mean, you've probably played in a few stadiums that were that were packed, and Oregon State's already got the experience of Fresno State, which was packed. Um, it's just going to be a different deal for Oregon State Saturday than it was against Utah. I, I, I would assume. Oh, yeah, 100% agree. I mean, I was on the field last year when we beat Utah, and that was electric and fun. I loved watching that game. And I, I think that with the momentum that we've taken from the Fresno State game where we played there in the big stadium with the Pac Stadium with all the fans there to playing the number seven team in the country with USC and barely losing to them, I, I don't think Oregon State goes in there, you know, like – scared shy or anything i think they go into it going like hey we still have all the momentum and i think this is a beatable utah team and i think last year when i was sitting there giving my opinion on how the game was going to end out it was also out of scarce like i hope this isn't like a oregon state that you know cowers down like the past couple years so i think i mean i think we go into this game or i think oregon state goes into this game and they they come out better than going in and it's going to be a close one. It's going to be a dog fight. I see us up seven and stressing me out again, but I see us winning by seven. Wow. Last week you were a hater. You picked beaters and lose by 17 this week. You're picking them to win by seven on the road. I'm not. Hopefully I'm right on one. (laughs) Wow. Um, uh, let's touch on a couple of things about Utah. Their their quarterback, Cameron Rising. He's, I mean, he's. It's just the latest in the quarterbacks Oregon State's having to deal with. I mean, he, first you got, you know, Jay Kaner from Fresno State, and then you had Caleb Williams from USC, and now you got Cam Rising, who, who's I, I think he's he's the favorite to win the Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. Uh, at this stage, it, it, it's probably going to come down to their game when they play USC, because there'll be those two quarterbacks on the field. Uh, there's a few other guys, too, are there in the running, but I would think he's probably the favorite at this point. Um, last year, he was 22 of 36 for 267 yards and two touchdowns, and he also ran 10 times for 73 yards against Oregon State. So, you know, they got an eyeful of him last year. What what I don't know how much you've, you've seen Cameron Rising play, but what, what, what was your impression of, of him as a quarterback from what you've seen? Yeah, I watched a little bit of him this year. I think it's going to be a um, very – it's going to be a very big thing that he can move. He can run. So it's like, you know, we got to keep him in the pocket, keep him contained. And, yeah, he can sling the ball. He can move the ball. So it's like, you know, I think if our defense can stick with what they're doing, on top of the linebackers are ready for a running quarterback, we definitely uh, – we can do well. But – if he starts getting outside the pocket and making his normal plays, his normal progressions, you know, just plays the way he knows how to play, it's going to be very rough for us to come down, you know, just time after time. And so we'll see how this goes. But, I mean, I, I believe in the Beavers. I'm a Beaver believer through and through. And I think this is a whole different game plan than it's going to be from, you know, against USC or even Fresno State because he's a different kind of runner. And he's a different kind of thrower. And plus, he's at a bigger level than Fresno State, so he he really gets this. Is he more is is rising more of a design runner than say Caleb Williams was? Because it seemed like Caleb Williams never really looked to run, but he was always on the run because he was getting pressured, and, and he always slipped out of. Every, it seemed like he slipped out of every pass rush. Yeah, that's the difference between Caleb and him. Is that Caleb only moved out of the pocket when needed. Caleb was that same way at Oklahoma where he loved being a pocket quarterback. He was good at it. And I think this guy can definitely move with his legs and make passes open for him. You know, Utah is really the epitome of a college football program. I mean, they, they, they build it under Kyle Whittingham. They, you know, he knows what he knows what he wants. You, you know, exactly what you're going to see from Utah. You know, you're going to see a tough physical team that, wants to run the ball and throw to the tight end and they'll mix in, you know, they, they've obviously got some good receivers too, but, but I mean, there's, there's no secrets when it comes to Utah. I, you, you played against them once, I think when was it 2016? Um, yeah. What, what do you, what do you remember just playing against a, a Kyle Whittingham team? They love to run the ball. They are the SEC of the PAC 12 where they're like, Hey, we're going to run it down your throat and basically make you either man up or, 
back out. And so, you know, it's going to be, can you stop the run? And then we'll go elsewhere. And can you stop the tight ends? And then we'll go elsewhere. You know, they're going to build it from the inside out. And, you know, we just need to stop one thing at a time and understand that the layers will start to unfold as we start taking things down. Utah's going to be without their, their big tight end, Brant Keithy. Um, I mean, he's, he, he's, I mean, he's probably the first, he was going to probably be the first team all Pac-12 tight end and, you know, barring, you know, like a Luke Musgrave or somebody like that. Cause he's, he's pretty much done it all. And that they'll, I mean, that's, that's a big blow to their offense, but I was just looking at their roster. They seem to have no shortage of tight ends there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to be a battle of tight ends. And I mean, they might've had a great tight end that's hurt at the moment, but I don't think any other, one of their other tight ends is near as good as him. So yeah, I think that makes it on equal playing field. If we still have Musgrave out and I think it's just going to be a good game overall. Last thing I want to, want to go to um, just go to the readers here, see if they got any questions. I'm just looking here. Um, what what do you think are the keys to the game against Utah? Keys to the game is going to start with run game. I think we still need to basically figure out how we're going to work that out. And then, again, like every week with Oregon State, it's more penalties than not. You know, we can't have bad snaps. We can't have uh, late snaps and basically just running out pointless clock. And I, it's going to be up to, I think, Chance Nolan's going to come back this week and just say, like, all right, Time to buckle down and read his keys and make the short progression throws if needed and make his deep passes on point without triple coverage. So I think he's going to definitely own up from last week and he's going to come back with this week with vengeance. And so yeah. that's going to be a main point. That's going to be very crucial to the team as well as, you know, just the run game and trying to figure out and we need to figure out who the running back's going to be. That's going to be our premier back. I think the One defense is great. Go for it. One other question was, uh, uh, the, I don't know if you've seen any of this on social media, but the post game was a little bit of a a crap fest. Um, you know, there was a couple of US some USC players were swimming on the on the Beaver logo at midfield, and there was some you know back and forth with USC players going up the the ramp with with fans and whatnot. And I just I, I'm just going. I, I don't really I don't really care that much. I, I mean. If fans are going to get if fans are going to get involved with the other team, I mean, that's what's going to happen. The, the the other team isn't going to be you know throwing up saying stuff if if the fans aren't throwing it back at them to start with. So and yeah. the and the swimming it the swimming on the Beaver logo it's it's not classy, but I don't know I don't I don't care that much. I don't know what you think of that, but I mean I just say hey they won a day, but I mean it's. There's a long battle. You, can't, you won a battle. You didn't win the war. I think we'll see them again here pretty soon, a couple weeks, I hope. And Or they'll lose. I don't think that they're as great as everybody thinks they are. Now it's definitely shown because Oregon State showed it. And, yeah, they won a day. They can swim on a logo. Good, good job for you. That's just, like, immature. But when you guys lose to some nobody or Utah or Oregon or Colorado or Cal, yeah, everybody's going to sit back and look at you and you're going to drop. You're going to see your ranking go from like seven right now or six to 21 to nobody. So, I mean, let them win the day, but they didn't win anything that big. We just showed America that they're not as great as everybody thinks they are. We'll uh, wrap this this week's edition of the Beaver Banner podcast up here. Uh, remember, you get your you can find this podcast wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Be uh, be sure to check out Oregon Live for all our Oregon State content. We'll uh, we'll be back next week to talk about the Beavers game at Utah, and then we'll look ahead to yet another evening football game at Stanford at eight o'clock on October eighth. My God, these night games are just so killing late. me. I mean. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, it'll be two o'clock getting out of the press box, but uh, it is what it is. It's what it's the back twelve. So, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll 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 see you next week on the podcast.